Good morning. Good morning and muy buenos dias a todos. Welcome back to day two of the Cave Dual Language Summer Virtual Institute in Spanish. We are so excited to be with you today and welcome you back to a wonderful day of learning and um, connecting and celebrating our languages together. I'm Jan Gustafson Correa. I'm really honored to be the Chief Executive Officer for CAVE. Y les doy la bienvenida muy calurosa. Um, we want to open our hearts and our minds to you all today, and they're so happy that you're with us. You know, one quote I'd like to start us off today um, is by um, Frank Smith, one of our great um, folks that worked with us in literacy for many years. And he shared, one language sets you in a corridor for life. Two languages open every door along the way. And, you know, I think with our Dual Language Immersion Institute, two languages, three languages, four languages, we know the power of language. And we are just thrilled that you're with us today to celebrate that power of language as well. I want to remind you, as this is our Summer Dual Language Spanish um, Institute for Dual Language Immersion, we are providing our general sessions in English with Spanish um, sprinkled in. But if you would like the full experience and listen to the whole presentation in Spanish, we invite you to go to the interpretation icon on the very bottom of your screen. And then you can select Spanish and you can listen to the interpretation of what is being shared by all the speakers. So les invitamos a que escuchen esta presentación. Si quieren la, el, el, la experiencia de estar totalmente en español, escoger el botón que dice interpretación al, al fondo de su pantalla y pueden escoger español. Y gracias a Natalia y a Esteban, estamos escuchando la, la interpretación de todo lo que se, se, se está hablando en español también. So thank you so much for that. I want to remind you today, as we um, do some little housekeeping, as we have our general session, you might want to use this time to make sure that you have your Zoom password handy. Remember, that was in the email that was sent to you by Andrea Gonzalez last Friday, the 18th. Um, you will need that as you go into your different Zoom rooms. There were a couple that had uh, didn't, didn't use the password yesterday. They will be in place today. So please make sure that you do have your Zoom password. And you might want to look for that today as we're going through the general session. So you have that right on hand. Um, I want to remind you that our keynote presentations, our general sessions and closing session, sessions are being recorded. And they will be posted to our CAVE um, website as well, our CAVE portal for the DLI Institute. During today's session with Ophelia Garcia, who is our keynote, which you'll be hearing more about in a second, you'll be having an opportunity to um, listen to her, but put questions and answers in the chat. And then today, when we come back at 12 o'clock, we'll have a question and answer session with Ophelia. So we invite you to be thinking questions you might want to have asked of her directly and add them to the chat as well. Um, don't forget that you can adjust your screen to any size you want with the, that top right hand button where it says view, or you can move, um, there's different ways you can move your screen, play around with that. When you're doing that, you're only impacting your own view and it gives you the best viewing up options as well. You might want to just see the presenter, you might want to see the, the presentation larger, whichever way you want to do that, that's fine. Um, the final thing that I want to share with you, if we go on to the next slide, is something that's really important to CABE and um, to the field. We are proposing to you today an urgent action. You know, we do this often at CABE as we follow different legislation. And there is a Senate bill coming up in this session called Senate Bill 237. It is a bill that CABE and our colleagues and friends at Californians Together at CTA um, the California Teacher Association, the California School Board Association, CSBA, and ASCA, the, our administrator um, group as well for California. We are all opposing SB 237 by Portatino. You know, SB 237 is often being called the dyslexia bill. And we want to be really clear that CAVE and all of our partners stand strongly in support of our students who may have needs with dyslexia and other special needs as well. And we know there are many ways to address those needs. We, though, are calling on all of us to oppose this bill. This bill would actually um, require that there would be a um, universal screening for all kindergarten through third grade students for dyslexia, no matter what. From kinder to third grade, every student would be screened. And um, that would require annual screening of 1.8 million students. Teachers will be required to be part of that. And that means over 400,000 of our English learners would be impacted as well. What we're concerned about with this is that it could create potential misidentification of young children 
just as they're beginning to develop their language skills. As they come into school, we hope they're in a dual language by literacy setting. They may or may not be. And if they're not, we're concerned that they also could be targeted and channeled into um, being identified as special needs when really they're really still just developing their language skills. We want to make certain that for our English learners, especially in those early years, that we're not narrowing the curriculum, that our students definitely need to have a literacy-based curriculum that's inclusive, not just of the phonetic and, and grammatical structures of language, but a meaning-making, language development, effective expression, and content knowledge. Right now, we feel that this bill does not meet those needs. It's kind of a one cookie cutter, one size fits all, and it's not appropriate for our English learner students, and it's not appropriate for many of our students of diverse language and cultural backgrounds. So we are asking you to, um, to oppose this. We'll be putting the, the URL in the chat in just a second, and we're gonna ask you to click on there. It takes about 30 seconds to add your voice to this and to um, sign on to oppose SB 237. And we will ask you also to share that with your friends and colleagues throughout the state as well. So with that, um, I'm ready to transition then into introducing um, a wonderful member of our Cabe Board of Directors. Um, Alicia Moreno Ramirez is our Region 2 representative for Cabe. Cabe is divided into different areas of the state. Um, region 2 is kind of the Central Valley all the way over to the Central Coast. Alicia Moreno Ramirez is a um, member of the Tulare County Office of Education, an amazing educator, and I'd like to welcome her today. Alicia, welcome. Good morning, Jan. Uh, buenos dias. Good morning to everyone, and welcome back to day two of Gavis Virtual Summer Spanish Dual Language Institute. I want to thank each of you for joining us today and for being here once again to further the initiative of dual language programs. It's great to be back together again at this institute, right? Um, I was here last year and I don't think any of us at that time could really have had a sense um, of what to expect over the, the next 12 months that would follow. And it's um, really become a changed world that we've been living and working in. As educators, we've struggled, learned, and excelled in how to deliver hybrid and online distance learning to our diverse student populations, and we've had to address the hard issues of racism and injustice. As parents, we've grappled with how to support home-based online learning, finding creative ways for our kids to stay connected, all while juggling our own disrupted work schedules and the uncertainty of the COVID context. As family members and friends, we've dealt with quarantining, illness, isolation, missing those we couldn't see, mourning those we may have lost, trying to keep our spirits high, knowing that we would somehow, someday, see the other side of the COVID struggle. And now, here we are today, a year later, feeling a bit, a bit more hopeful. As we bring the 2021 school year to a close, I know we all have cautious hopes and optimisms and expectations that we will soon be able to return safely back to in-person learning. As we do that, I encourage you to think deeply about that, what that in-person learning will look like and feel like for students and teachers alike. GABA's CREATE framework, which you're being introduced to you in, in your different strands, helps us focus on equity-centered learning, relationships, new systems and structures, transformative pedagogy, and learning acceleration. CREATE guides us to reflect on how we will welcome our students back and understand and meet their socio-emotional needs. It focuses on how we will keep equity at the center of all that we do, on how teaching and learning will look and feel fresh and relevant, and on how we will celebrate language and culture and the various, various experiences of all of our students. Language development and growth in both English and Spanish or another partner language will certainly be a focus in our dual language classroom. And I'm just thrilled that today we will have the opportunity to hear from one of the great dual language educators, linguists, researchers and pedagogists in the field is our keynote, Dr. Ofelia Garcia. As we listen to Ofelia today, please be sure to place any questions you have for her in the chat, and we will be having a special Q&A session with her at noon at 12 o'clock during the 12 o'clock session. We thank Kaslin Publishing for sponsoring Dr. Ofelia Garcia's presentation today, and I want to re welcome Rebecca Field from Kaslin to the Zoom stage to introduce us to Ofelia. Welcome, Rebecca. Introduce five books in the bioliteracy collection. 
Hi, my name is Rebecca Field from Caslon Publishing, and I'd like to introduce five books in the biliteracy collection to you. I'd like to emphasize that biliteracy is power. In addition to accelerating the literacy development of bilingual learners and strengthening academic achievement, biliteracy can help us challenge English only by elevating the status of Spanish or other language minoritized languages in the United States. And in this way, it's an important tool as we strive for equity and racial justice in schools today. First book is by Literacy from the Start, and this introduced a holistic by literacy framework with Spanish and English brought together side by side for instruction and assessment. Um, important feature of this book is that teachers learn how to develop assessment systems and gather empirical evidence of their students by literacy development. Teaching for biliteracy can be used across any content area, any grade level, and one of the important features about this one is the bridge for cross-linguistic transfer, when the teachers bring the two languages together to help students compare and contrast their languages and develop metalinguistic awareness. The Literacy Club is a tier two small group inter intervention that uh, can be used in Spanish, or in English, and there's detailed instructions about how to use it in both languages in the book. The Translanguage in Classroom really teaches teachers how to look and how to listen at what their students are doing with language so that they can build on that, leverage that bilingualism for learning. Enseñanza en el aula bilingüe is written primarily in Spanish. So it's an elementary methods book written in Spanish, so teachers learn the methods and also develop their pedagogical Spanish, all from a translanguaging perspective. So that's the collection. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the books or you'd like to talk about how to use them in professional learning, please contact me at caslonpublishing.com. Thank you very much. And now we are happy to welcome back Rebecca Field um, live. Rebecca? Hi, I can't figure out how to do my video right now. I'm really sorry about that. Let me see, but you've just seen me. So I'd like to just tell you that I'm really happy to introduce Ophelia Garcia. She's the co-author with Susan Ibarra Johnson and Kate Seltzer of the Translanguaging Classroom. And I'm really happy because each of you will have free 60 day access to that book after, after this particular institute. Ophelia is a linguist and an educator. And as I mentioned before, what I love about her work is she really teaches us to look closely at what students are doing with their two languages or with the language features of both of their languages so we know how to build. It's not like thinking about students from Spanish speaking backgrounds and English speaking backgrounds separately. Ophelia's work has been an inspiration to me and to many others for a long time. If you've heard her before, if you haven't heard her before, you're in for a treat. Thank you so much. And here's Ophelia Garcia. Muchas gracias, Rebeca. De nada. Oh, sorry. Y, y muchas gracias a todo el team de Cabe, a Jan, a, a todo el mundo. I'm not going to name because I'll leave out, but I want to make sure that I uh, thank Vanessa for um, who has really facilitated this uh, Zoom uh, meeting with all of you. Eh, les hablo desde Nueva York. It's, um, let's see, uh, 11.45 right now. Um, I had the moving up ceremony of my granddaughter this morning, um, and um, I speak to you today full of emotion because I heard fifth graders talk about how difficult this year has been for them. Uh, así que para mí es un honor uh, estar hablando con maestros, maestras que han um, pasado por tanto y que have been the real warriors in this incredible war that we have uh, waged over the last year and a half. Así que muchísimas gracias uh, a todos. Um, yo les voy a hablar de why, why, por qué 
uh, does uh, dual language bilingual education need translanguaging? And I'm going to use that word, which I will define afterwards. But first, I think it's important for us to think together of what does it mean for education. Y la pregunta siempre es por qué, para qué, why are we doing all of this? Uh, y la respuesta siempre es for los niños, especially Latinx children, uh, because they need to be educated con pasión, con amor, with love, uh, and especially with understandings of uh, sus propios conocimientos, uh, their own understandings, not the understandings of others, but the understandings of their community. Um, you notice that I talk about dual language bilingual education, and I always insist in the B, in D-L-B-E, and I insist in it because I think that otherwise we forget the struggles that connect us historically. You know, I'm thinking of 1968 and the East Los Angeles blowouts. You're probably too young to remember them, but I do. Uh, y creo que es importante que nuestro movimiento de educación bilingüe no pierda ese compromiso con la comunidad con que empezamos, ¿no? Um, so I think that's, that's important. And I think it's also important to think about translanguaging because I don't believe that dual language can be just for languages. No es para el inglés, no es para el español. Who is it for? It's para los niños, it's for the community, it's for the comunidad. So that is the reason why we need something that stretches the ways in which we have been doing, I think, dual language education in this country. Um, so to do that, let me just tell, uh, take you into Carla's fourth grade class. In the book that uh, you are about to get from Rebecca and Caslon, um, we, we portray different chill, uh, teachers. One of them is Carla, and Carla is a fourth grade dual language teacher uh, who works in New Mexico. She's from New Mexico. Um, y Carla uh, is in a school district that has give that it has one model. El modelo es, el tipo de educación es 50-50, uh, and what she's expected to do by uh, through the district language policy is uh, uh, un día enseñar en español and the next day to teach in, in English. So, ¿cuál es el problema? El problema es que un modelo no funciona para todos los estudiantes que Carla tiene en la clase. Carla has a range of students, the range of students that are not simply English language learners and Spanish language learners, but they fall along the entire bilingual continuum that we all have, right? So the problem is she has, for example, Efraín. Well, Efraín actually eh, cruzó la frontera, desde, viene de Honduras, cruzó la frontera hace un año. But she also has Minerva, who actually, uh, the, both the abuelitos and the parents are Mexican-Americans um, and was born in this country. And she also has Gladys, and Gladys has a Guatemalan mother and an African-American father. So the problem that we are faced with when we teach in dual language bilingual classrooms is that uh, we are given one way of teaching, and yet we have a variety of, of students in the class, and we don't know how to adapt it for them, right? So, ese es el problema. Uh, cuando Carla empieza a enseñar, when she first starts teaching, of course, uh, she is told to do the reading workshop according to the language of the day. So what does she do? She polices the language of the students. She tells them, this day you can only read, speak, and write in English. Y en este día puedes simplemente hablar, escribir y leer solamente en español. So she polices the language because that's the way she has been um, trained to think about language. 
because she thought the objective of dual language was to teach languages. And she has forgotten that the objective of dual language is to teach, to educate children and to educate a Latinx community that will be able to uh, make sense for themselves of a future in the United States. Um, ¿Y qué es lo que pasaba cuando ella hacía esto? Bueno, pues Efraín no entendía cuando la clase era en inglés y Minar, Minerva was just not engaged when the class was in Spanish and Gladys really couldn't express herself fully in this arrangement. So um, Carla, who was a very um, a perceptive teacher, one that made sense of, of what was happening in her classroom, like all good teachers do, uh, she, well, she started listening to what the children were doing and to think about how they were making sense of what she was teaching. And what she started to realize is that children were using as many resources as they were allowed to use during the day to make sense, right? So sometimes not language per se, but drawing and gestures and, and role playing, and they were using all of it. Um, and she went farther. She started thinking, well, how is it that I, I make sense of my own children's language at home, right? And she started thinking, okay, so when I play jingo with my three-year-old i don't just don't do it in spanish and i just don't do it in english but sometimes the cards have the names in english and i read them in english and some and they also have the picture so i say them in spanish so this is the way that i engage my three-year-old and and so on right so she started thinking oh how do i how do i how do my own children make sense in my own bilingual space and um, as she started questioning all of this, she started thinking of how do I step into the children's meaning making space? And to me, that is the essential question, right? But because it's not about bridging, it's not a bridge, right? We keep thinking, well, we bridge from one language to the other. No, it's not about bridging. It's about making sure that we step with the children into this bilingual world in which they live, right? Uh, to quote uh, Gloria Saldúa, this entre mundos, this borderlands in which they live. Uh, and it's very important to then step with the children into this space, because after all, they're going to be Latinx, US people in the United States, bilingual, biliterate, but within the United States, not with monolingual um, uh, thinking uh, and as a minoritized and racialized community. So all of this has to be taken into account. So of course, Carla starts questioning, well, uh, language, what is English, what is Spanish? She starts questioning bilingualism. She's been taught to think of bilingualism is simply the addition of an L1 to an L2. But she starts thinking, well, I know what Efrain's first language was, but I really don't know what Minerva's is. So she started questioning this idea of additive bilingualism. Uh, she started questioning the categories that children have, because some of them had been um, labeled uh, long-term English language learner when they their Spanish was very hesitant. And she started questioning the bilingual teaching, which separated always strictly the English from Spanish. So one of the questions, one of the things that, that Carla started experimenting with was how to take small steps. I always think with teachers, well, um, you know, I, I, to think of Martin Luther King saying of, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. Uh, so uh, Carla started thinking, well, how do I take a first step? Because after all, I have to work within my district's language policy. But what is it that I can do? And the one thing that Carla started with was to open up a space, which she called the Cuéntame Algo space during her, her uh, reading workshop. So how did she do that? Let's, let's go through this steps that she took. So one of the things she did was during the read aloud 
the read aloud was always done in the language of the day. But she always chose books that were both written in English and translated into Spanish or vice versa. And that were also about topics that were meaningful to the children so that they could question who they were, who uh, and what is it, how is it that they use language and what about their lives uh, as Latin, uh, Latinx people in the United States. Um, so for example, this day, uh, she had this lesson. She was reading, uh, My Name is Marisabel, which I think all of you know, uh, which also has Me Llamo Marisabel, so that she could do one day of my, uh, my Name is Marisabel, and the next day she followed up with a Spanish text, Me Llamo Marisabel. But what's important is that in doing this, she was not only exploring and developing the ability to make sense of the text, but also the ability of the children to make sense of themselves, of identity, of white privilege. Why is it that the teacher felt that uh, she could call the student Mary and not uh, uh, call her Marisabel, uh, of these processes of minoritization and racialization that the Latinx community has gone through. Uh, at a level, uh, with a, a context, the naming, uh, which they could all understand and relate to. Um, but, and what she did was, as she read, according to the language of the day, Day, she encouraged uh, the questions and answers to be done uh, with whatever resources they have. So that Efrain, when they were reading, my name is Marisabel, could actually ask a question uh, in Spanish, or so that they could do, um, uh, she could do, um, uh, turn and talk. She could pair the students up and have them turn and talk and allow them then on their own, without her own um, participation, to actually uh, um, use whatever resources they have to make sense of what, what they were listening to in the language of the day. Then when, they did, when she did guided reading, she did the same. She put them in groups uh, to discuss. And these were very heavy discussions, let me tell you, about why it was that the teacher insisted in calling her Mary instead of Marisabel and what it meant for Marisabel to be called Mary. Uh, but all those discussions had to take place not in the language of the day, but in, with whatever resources the children had. And she allowed this because she wanted to make sure that the children understood that reading is about making sense, about thinking with the text about your own life and the lives of others. And that, that's what was, was important to her. Um, but she also always ended with some sort of role playing where the students actually made an oral presentation. And there she knew how to differentiate between proceso and producto. What do I mean by that? Well, she knew that for these children, these bilingual children, to make sense of, uh, of what they were doing, el proceso tenía que no estar limitado a una lengua u otra, right? It had to be fluid. But she always had in mind what the producto was going to be in, right? So was the producto going to be in English or in Spanish? And then uh, she could then adjust so that some of the groups did the producto in one language, some of the groups did the producto in the other language, but all of them actually were allowed to bring in uh, their drawings, things from home, uh, their uh, complete language repertoire, all of what they had, all the resources they had uh, in the uh, presentation. So these are the small steps, the careful pasos that um, uh, Carla took uh, in, in, in um, in making sure that this was uh, advancing. 
So I want to stop for a second and take you out of the context of Carla's classroom, because now we've seen what Carla has done. But sometimes we forget that in the foundation, there has to be a theoretical perspective, right? You have to think of why you do it, but you have to think, what am I basing these steps on? Porque estos pasos, no? Um, and what we start to understand is that Carla has started to develop uh, some translanguaging entendimientos, and here I'm going to use the word again, translanguaging. Uh, and what are these translanguaging entendimientos, these conocimientos about these bilingual children that Carla starts to develop? And remember, she was questioning language, she was questioning bilingualism, she was questioning the labeling of the children, and she was questioning even uh, bilingual teaching. So let me just then uh, summarize for you some of the translanguaging entendimientos that Carla now has as she steps into the children's space with these small steps, little bit at a time, uh, that open up this other space. So one of the things she realizes is that language is much more than just an objeto that you have, right? You never have language, ever. That's why we continue to study language, because uh, depending on the task that you are asked to do, you have to develop certain features, certain practices, and so you never have language. Language is not an object, it's not an entity, it's not an autonomous entity, right? Uh, it's not uh, la lengua de los Estados Unidos, el inglés, y la lengua de Latinoamérica, el español. That's not what language is. Language is the ability of whole human beings all of us, to really be able to assemble and orchestrate all our resources, all the resources we have to really make sense of our own lives, right? And this is something that all human beings do, and this is a, a capacity that's widely distributed. Uh, so don't, you know, sometimes we think these and I've, said, I've heard teachers say, my students don't have language, impossible. All human beings have this capacity to assemble and orchestrate our resources to make meaning of our own lives. The problem is where you square off, where you say that the only definition of language is the one that the nation state or the school gives you. You have to go beyond this. So Carla has started to develop this understanding that language, her understanding of language goes beyond what the nation state, the school has told her is language. That language is what people do uh, to communicate, to orchestrate the resources. The second part is bilingualism. Uh, she has been told over and over again that bilingualism is simply the addition of one language to the addition of the other language. You have to think, I mean, those definitions of bilingualism were developed uh, because we are used to um, um, elite populations becoming sequential bilinguals. That is, they go to school, when high school, in the United States anyway, and they become bilingual, right? But that is not what all of our children are doing. Our children, Carla's own children, Carla's children in the classroom, were simultaneous bilinguals. They were becoming bilingual in life, not sequentially. Uh, they really have bilingualism as a first language, if you want to call it that. So bilingualism is not, no es aditivo, nunca es aditivo. Bilingual, uh, bilingualism for uh, uh, the community that, that we care about is completely dinamico, completely. Uh, it's not the addition of two entities, but it's the way in which we do as bilinguals language. And I'm gonna say something that is important. We do language, bilinguals do language with a unitary repertoire, con un repertorio único, un unitario, no con dos lenguas, nunca con dos lenguas. You might only see one language, but that is because the other language is being restricted, repressed, right? Pero verdaderamente estamos utilizando nuestro repertorio total cuando eh, estamos en libertad 
de usar eh, todo nuestro repertorio, which doesn't happen often, right? Because often we are, we do that in our own homes, we do that in the bilingual community, but often when we are in with monolingual interlocutors, we are only selecting part of our repertoire, and that is one of the problems. One of the problems is that the whole unitary repertoire of bilinguals does not get seen, seen. Only the part that is being called forth by majority society, or in some cases at the home, uh, is being seen, not, not the whole thing. Uh, and so uh, she really starts understanding that bilingualism is not the addition of two languages, is the use of a full repertoire and how do you make visible then this full repertoire of bilinguals. The third thing was about bilingual students and what does she start thinking about bilingual students? And she starts understanding that bilinguals are not separate categories, children are not separate categories and that we are all emergent bilinguals. All of us are emergent bilinguals because depending on the task that we're asked to do, our bilingualism extends or, or does not, right? So the, we are all emergent bilinguals and she starts really understanding that bilinguals have a rich repertoire, a, a repertoire that is greater than that of monolingual students. So the problem is that schools do not make visible the whole entire repertoire. So when she realizes this, she also starts thinking about what bilingual teaching means. And she starts understanding that what she really has to do is to make sure that the whole entire repertoire of the children is made visible, right? Uh, uh, in, and that when you repress half of the repertoire, you're really doing something that is completely um, that causes inequities because it's again like having a child that has that can drum with only one hand because you're holding the other one behind his back and comparing it to one that has uh, is allowed to drum with two hands the sounds are not going to be the same so she starts realizing the inequities of always controlling the, the uh, half of the repertoire of the children in one language or the other. Um, so um, she starts thinking of this uh, whole repertoire. So um, one of the things that are the book, the translanguage in classroom that you will have uh, access to uh, does is makes us think about, I think three elements that all translanguaging classrooms need to think about. One is the stance that the teacher has, and we called it in the book, the juntos stance, the together stance, the collaborative stance. Why? Because children and teachers and languages have to come together. They have to be juntos in strength, in the strength of the community. And how do you then uh, understand the strength and then build upon it. So, uh, and how does a teacher become a co-learner so that she becomes interested in what, what the children know so that this becomes really very visible. Then of course you have to design the spaces, right? You have to design, Carla designed this Cuéntame Algo space, which was within the structures of the reading workshop that her school district and the school language policy that the school district was following. But it's a space, right? It's a space that she opens up. And then thirdly, what are the shifts that have to occur? Because the other thing is that um, uh, the, there's always a corriente in a classroom and translanguaging is also a corriente, right? Uh, and it's very, very important for the teachers to follow this translanguaging corriente that the children actually establish, right? Because that's what causes the engagement. Otherwise, knowledge and understandings are stagnant. So how do you cause this dynamic, this corriente, to flow through the classroom? And how do you follow it? Because after all, we teaching is about responding to the children. One of the things that we have to think about is uh, por qué, por qué uh, Carla then 
opens up these translanguaging spaces that follow the corriente. Um, and there are three things that I think have to be taken into account. Uh, one is the use of the tra of translanguaging for scaffolding. That is, um, I always say it's like um, throwing children um, a lifesaver, a floater, a floater, right? So that un salvavida para que uh, no se no se hundan, no. And within, um, for example, the English space, the English uh, language day, she has to Carla has to be able to throw Efraín un salvavidas que que funcione en español so that he understands the English lesson. So sometimes translanguaging acts like a, a, a salvavidas, right? Uh, sort of, sort of um, extending Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, if we can remember that, right? Uh, sometimes translanguaging acts uh, because para documentar, to assess what the child really knows, right? You cannot do that if you only allow the child access to half of their linguistic repertoire. You cannot uh, find out that Minerva loves to contar un cuento y dramatizarlo. You cannot find out that Gladys loves to write and illustrate stories because you're only thinking of what we call in the book specific language performances. But there are also general language performances. How do you use language to tell a joke, uh, to narrate, uh, to argue? Uh, all of these are functions that are not language specific. And you have to be able to differentiate between a child that has just arrived and doesn't have yet, has not extended, does not have the appropriate features yet, has not extended their repertoire, and a child that still has to develop this ability, these, this linguistic ability to tell stories, etc., which has nothing to do with one language or the other. And finally, I think that translanguaging is important para tra la transformación de la comunidad, para, para que los niños entiendan que las prácticas lingüísticas que utilizan en su hogar es, son válidas y son importantes, and not that what their mother speaks is not appropriate, but what, what the community speaks is also appropriate. And this has to do with a transformation of identities, which is very, very important. Así que para terminar, I think that um, it's important to remember uh, that translanguaging actually fits with the six mindsets of create that Kabe has been instilling on you. It is a transformational pedagogy, that's a T. Uh, it is beyond all of it about equity and equitable teaching practices. It's also the about R, the relationships, and about E, the engagement. The accountability is clear, but the accountability is to the children in the community first. And, and I think lastly, I want to transform the C because I think consistency is not where it's at. Where it's at is critical commitment to following the children in the community and following their translanguage in corriente. Muchísimas gracias a todos por escucharme y espero que tengan un buen día y estaré lista para las respuestas, las preguntas y respuestas más tarde. Gracias.